Because uh, why not? Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. What's the matter? It's funny. It's good. Keep going. Keep going, Andy. Oh, good morning again. All Zoomers and streamers, welcome. Um, yeah, just want to start off with a story. Uh, a man sent it to me, and I watched it this morning. And it was quite actually incredible. I mean, it took, uh, yeah, made you think. And basically, it's uh, David Pawson. And he's doing a talk in America. And basically, he um, is rec rec recounting a story that this woman told him. Uh, she was travelling from Australia to New Zealand. And halfway across the Tasman Sea, a huge, huge electrical storm just fired up. And the plane was rocking, and, and, and they literally thought they were going to die. The people started screaming, and the woman was sat next to another lady who was taking photographs of the storm outside the window, of what was happening inside, and... On, you can't see it, but, but what a man sent me was you could see what was happening inside the, the aircraft. It was horrific. I mean, literally, at one point, the plane was like that. And people were screaming. And she noticed that the woman next to her, looking out the window, was quietly praying. And she said, excuse me, but are you a Christian? She said, yes. Do you mind praying together? And they prayed for the peace, two pieces the peace outside for the storm to be, you know, and they said 2,000 years ago, Jesus, you walked upon the, the water, you calmed the storm, and it, it went calm. Can you bring two pieces, the peace inside the plane? Because people thought they were going to die. People were hugging each other, saying goodbye, you know, and all the rest of it. And within two minutes of them praying, peace just descended in the airplane. Everyone was sat there quietly. And she thought, okay, let's pray for peace outside. And she said, well, I'll just take one more photograph. And she just got a camera to the, the window, took the photograph, and then suddenly the storm stopped outside. Unbelievable. Anyway, the plane lands safely. She then says, well, you know, it's the old type of camera. It's not digital. It shows you how long ago it was. She takes a color film to go and get it um, uh, developed. The guy rings her up, who's developing the film, and says, excuse me, but your, your films are ready, but will you please come and pick them up in person? And she goes, yes, of course I will. So she goes there. He's there, and his family's there. And they said, will you explain this photograph? And I'll try and put it up on the WhatsApp group. The one that she took on the outside... There's the picture of Jesus outside, in colour, full colour. The whole image of Jesus, just literally in the cloud of the storm. And it is, I mean, it is, I mean, I was, all the hackles, all the hairs went up when I, when I saw it, with Jesus in the clouds, because Jesus has arisen. We're Easter Sunday, and Jesus has arisen. So Heidi and I just... Well, Heidi got her, her head together this morning. Um, I was up early walking dogs, and she came to, Andy, can we do this? So we're just, we want to start a different way. So Heidi, do you want to? Okay, I'll do it. I don't mind first. I'll do mine first. Then, uh, so if you just turn with me to Exodus 12. Exodus 12, verse 12. Sorry, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. 
And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's needs. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb will be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of those congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintels of their houses where they eat. Then they shall eat the flesh that night, roast it in the fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head and with its legs and its entrails. You shall let alone of it remain until the morning, and what remains of it in the morning you shall burn with fire. Thus shall you, you, and thus you shall eat it with the belt of your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover." I will pass through the land of Egypt at that night and will strike the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the guards of, of Egypt, I will execute my judgment. I am the Lord. Then the blood of a sign of your house where you are, where you see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not come on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt." So this is the beginning of the Passover, the Passover of the passing over the angel of death, passing over the whole of the Israelites. And we, at this point in, on this, this weekend, we just remember it is Jesus that is the perfect lamb. He is the perfect lamb of the firstborn. But what we wanted to start with is that when the high priest in Jesus' time, and, and from that, what we've just read in Exodus, the high priest would find the, 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 the lamb. It would be brought into Jerusalem. They would examine it for how many days? Three days. They would examine the perfect lamb. And they would see whether it was without spot or wrinkle. So, what Derek Prince preached was, just like the high priest, the high priest would come in and he would sprinkle the blood seven times between the second veil where he entered and of the front or the east side of the mercy seat itself. So there was an initial sprinkling of blood seven times in the whole ceremony of sacrificing the lamb and the day, and the day of atonement. So we know that number seven indicates the the. the the perfection of work, of, of holy perfection, um, spiritual perfection, spiritual completeness. So we know the number seven is very significant. However, there was also a prophetic sprinkling in the life of Jesus. And we've got number seven. So when, when was the first time that we see the sprinkling of blood from the Lord Jesus? Well, we see that. I'm just giving one example of Luke 22, verse 14 where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was such in travail, he sweated blood. That was the first one. Then they struck him in the face with their hands and their fists and their rods. That was the second time that blood was spilt and that's Luke 22 also, but from verses 63 to 64. Then they also flogged him. So that was the scourging that the Romans did. So that's the third time that Jesus blood was sprinkled the next time it was when they ripped out his beard from his face and we know that from Isaiah 50 verse 6 then we know the thorns was pressed onto his scalp Matthew 27 verse 29 and that was the fifth time the sixth time was when his hands and his feet were pierced with nails sixth time of the spread of the 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 um, sprinkling of blood and then we know the seventh time when it was finished was when Jesus' side was pierced by the Roman centurion. So I'm going to hand over to Heidi. Shall I leave my glasses there? Yeah, I forgot to bring mine. 
I just felt it was really significant how Passover, of course, we know this, but it's just to remember how Passover just links in with the crucifixion of Jesus and what it means to us. And it's just so powerful. The other thing about, about the, putting the blood over the lintels of the, I always want to say lentils, over the lintel of the house, of the doorpost. Um, I read that um, in the Egyptian times that they would inscript their name into the doorpost because that was made of stone. And that therefore, so that therefore the house owner would put their name in that, that stone because in their belief system, it's, uh, if their name is preserved amongst other things, it means that's part of the promise for them that they would live eternally. This is not according to the Bible, it's not according to God, God's ways, but it was the, the Egyptian ways. So what's interesting is that even though the Israelites were living amongst the Egyptians, um, they did take on you know, many of their ways of living and their, their traditions. But when they put the blood on the lintels, it was like the blood went over their name, which I just think is beautiful. So the blood of the lamb was covering their name. And it just reminds me um, so much about, you know, where are, where are our names? Are our names in the Lamb's Book of Life? You know, do we have the blood of Jesus over us, over our names? And it's, you know, it's something you don't, you're not born with it. You have to make a decision for it. And, and I just think it's just awesome and important to revisit these basic foundational truths. Um, so what Andy shared about reading from there, and also about the seven places where the blood of Jesus was, was spilt and sprinkled, relating it back to um, the, the Levitical um, instructions that God gave to the Israelites about the Day of Atonement. So Jesus was our atonement. He was that sacrifice, and we're so grateful. And, you know, for me, I'm just... I was born into a Christian family, as you all know. But for me, I still had to make a decision. And I will never forget when I was five. And Stephen, my brother, oh, sorry, don't get emotional. Uh, Stephen, my brother, read to me, you know, told me about Jesus dying on the cross and that I needed to be forgiven for my sins and that what sins were was just simply living for myself and missing the mark and that everybody needed to be saved. And it doesn't happen automatically. You've got to ask Jesus for this. You've got to be honest with him and, and really mean it from the bottom of your heart. And I remember being absolutely mortified to find out that Jesus didn't get himself off the cross, but he stayed on it. And I was like, but he could have done it. He could have got himself off. And as a five-year-old, I just found that really shocking and disappointing because I wanted that sort of superhero sort of, hey, look at me, I can do everything. And, and yet that is the amazing humility. And that's what love does. Love takes you places that you don't necessarily want to go. But when Jesus said yes to the Father, I will drink this cup. That was it. That was the that was the sign of absolute obedience. And then everything that followed is as a result. And I'm just so, so grateful. And I just want to encourage everybody listening, you know, whether you were born into a Christian family or not, whether you are, you know, been going to church for years or not, it's like this invitation is always open and it demands it demands a response. And I'm just so grateful, you know, for Jesus. I'm so grateful. Um, you know, I lost my mum many years ago, my dad, and I know that through hope in Jesus, I know I will see them again because they also love the Lord. We have such a promise and we are so grateful. You know, Anne, sweet Anne, she, you know, thank God for eternity. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. So I just wanted to, I, I read this lovely testimony this morning uh, from a Brit um, a Brit called Dominic um, Mwaya, I don't know how you pronounce his surname, Mwaya, yeah, and, uh, and he's, he's a British evangelist, loves the Lord, and uh, goes on the streets and is prepared to be arrested or whatever just because he loves the Lord and he wants to share the gospel and good on him. And I just want to read these three paragraphs because I thought it was really beautifully written and it concludes with a personal testimony from him. And testimonies are powerful. Testimonies are so powerful. And, you know, I just think as a group here and amongst us with the streamers and the Zoomers, we want to really maintain and nurture the participation of sharing testimonies. It builds up. It changes life. It changes your outlook. It destroys mindsets and strongholds that can hold us back. We hear somebody else's testimony and it gives you joy and it gives you hope and it, it stirs you. So I'm just going to read this and then we're going to go into time of praise unless anybody has something else that they want to share. 
Good, good. So I'll just read this. Um, 2.3 billion people on planet Earth will in some way today celebrate the resurrection of a dead rabbi crucified naked on a ruddy bit of wood outside the gates of Jerusalem. The man claimed to be the son of God. The whole affair was a disgrace. There was hardly anyone at his execution. He was mocked as he died, but forgave his killers nonetheless. Then the earth shook. The rocks split. The sky went dark. Dead prophets rose from tombs and walked the streets of Jerusalem. And the veil in the temple was split asunder, making access into the presence of a holy God possible for normal people. So the biblical record goes, three days later, this Jesus bust out of his own tomb and walked the earth, teaching and readying his disciples for the greatest revolution the world has ever known. Then he ascended into heaven, and another ten days later, he lit a spiritual bonfire over his band of followers. The rest is history. The world was turned upside down. And this is now the testimony of this, this man, Dominic. I can only speak for myself, but just over 20 years ago, after some months of struggling with the meaning and purpose of life, I had an encounter with God in a barn in Sussex. I repented for my sins, and I called up on Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. I knew the prayer was costing me everything. It was not a timid prayer. The Holy Spirit came over my body with liquid, fiery love, joy, and peace, and I was ruined forever. Near every day since then, that resurrection power and love has visited the mortal frame that is my existence, as I've sought the Lord Jesus with my whole heart. There is nowhere or no one that comes close to providing the life and resurrection my soul craves on a daily basis. I wish everyone reading this or hearing it a happy Easter, happy Passover, happy Sunday. Jesus Messiah is indeed risen, and one day we shall all kneel before him and confess him as Lord. I pray that you will look forward to that day as much as I or more. Thank you, Lord. Do you want to? So, Lord, we just give ourselves to you as you so freely gave yourself for us. And we in turn just respond that we just love you with all of our hearts. Jesus, we need you even more as we see the day of your return approaching. And we thank you that you were the spotless lamb. You were the lamb without blemish, without sin. And yet you took each and every one of us by name and died for our sins. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We thank you that we can sit here, stand here, be in our homes, in our hotel rooms, wherever it is. But Lord, we commit our lives to you today afresh. And we say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come and touch us with your fire. Come and touch us so people can watch us burn with a passion and a love for you. That is beyond anything of this world. And we pray now for our cities, our towns, our villages, our neighborhoods, for the blood of Jesus to be put on their lentils. Jesus, we pray now, let there be an outpouring of your presence in this place. Jesus, let there be an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this place. Let there be the fear of the Lord in this place. Let this be a place of miracles, signs and wonders because you, the King of Kings is here. We thank you, Jesus, because we can do nothing without you, but we give ourselves to you. Thank you for this day. Because Jesus, you rose from the dead and the same spirit that raised you from the dead lives in each and every one of us. So I pray now, touch anybody hearing my voice, touch us in this place, heal our bodies where we need healing. If you need a healing, just put that, your hand on that part of your body and ask the Holy Spirit 
to now touch you. And we ask you to bless this table, Lord, at this time to remember that you shed your blood and you said, this is my blood of the renewed covenant, which is given to you for the remission of your sins. And then he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which I give to you because I took all your pain, all your suffering, all your sickness, all your diseases, all of your infirmities onto my body. So we thank you, Lord, that you are touching people now. You're healing bodies right now. And we thank you for the resurrection life that is in your name. I thank you that Heidi will see her parents again. We will see Anne again. We will see loved ones again because they have given their lives to you. And that you are, it says, I am the life. And whoever drinks of me will not thirst, but have everlasting life. And we thank you. But Lord, we pray now amongst bushfire and in this place, in this place in Sheffield, in Fox Hill, where we are right now, Lord, let your spirit now come into this place in a tangible way. Let there be an overflowing of your presence in this place. Let the revival start breaking out where we see the sinner cry out to be forgiven. And we pray for our countries. We pray for Great Britain. Lord, set this nation apart. And if you're living in another nation, pray that prayer now. Set our nations apart, our areas apart for you, Jesus. Do it now, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. and sing a wonderful hymn uh, over 150 years old if not older sing thine be the glory risen conquering sun endless is the
we do not want to have any doubt. We want to be so faith-filled. And we thank you, Lord, that it comes. You give us faith, Lord. It comes by hearing, hearing your word, Lord. We believe, we believe. So no more we doubt the glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee. Aid us in a strife. Just as it was in the past, so 
over, Lord. We thank you for the blood that is applied onto our name, onto our doorpost. And Lord, we may see, we may witness with our eyes. But we thank you, Lord God, that the wrath of God will not be spilt upon us. But we are preserved, we are kept. We thank you, Jesus. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind. I was running out of time. And sin separated was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt I owed Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of light Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Amen. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. 
Thank you, Jesus, that soon 
you are going to be coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Just want to read something to you. As Heidi just uh, goes and just prepares what she's got to do. But I want to read something to you. She's just going to prepare the talk. That's all. No, but I understand. But I want to read something to you that had a massive, massive impact on me as a very early Christian. I heard this preached and uh, it, it struck me to the very inner, my inner man, my inner spirit. And it's been with me ever since. It's been, I've been a Christian now since I was 28. So I've been a Christian quite a while. But um, this poem has never lost me. Never lost to really, if you want to see Heidi getting emotional, I always get emotional at this, always. Um, but I, I just felt in my spirit that there's somebody who doesn't know Jesus. And I want to show you how easy it is to know Jesus. Um, some of you might know I'm an XPE teacher, but I also studied history um, and taught history. So I, I'm quite aware of First World War po poetry. You know, Rupert Brooks and, and all the rest, and just uh, fantastic men of God. Um, but this is somebody who you would never have heard of. He, he's not up there in the, uh, the First World War po poetry. But I want to read you what he wrote, and I'll tell you a little bit about it afterwards. But it just, this is him writing. He says, look, God, I've never spoken to you, but I want to say to you, how do you do? You see, God, they told me you didn't exist, and like a fool, I believed all this. Last night, from the trench, I saw your sky. I figured right then they told me a lie. Had I taken to time the, to see the things you've made, I know they weren't calling a spade a spade. I wonder, God, if you'd shake my hand. Somehow I feel you'd understand. Funny I had to come to this hellish place before I had the time to see your face. Well, I guess there isn't much more to say, but I'm sure glad, God, I met you today. I guess zero hour will soon be here, but I'm not afraid. But I'm not afraid since I know you're near. The signal, well, God, I have to go. I like you a lot. I want you this to know. Look now, this will be a horrible fight, and who knows, I may come to your house tonight. Though I wasn't friendly with you before, I wonder, God, if you'd wait at your door. Look, I'm crying, me shedding tears. I wish I'd known you all these many years. Well, now I soon have to go. So, God, goodbye. Strange, since I met you, I'm not afraid to die. Look, God, I've never spoken to you, but I want to say, how do you do? And it just shows you that in the hell of a place of the First World War, how a man could find God in a place like that is just astounding. And God in his mercy, I believed, like the two thieves that were hung on that cross with Jesus, where one made it into heaven. And he was given that assured promise by Jesus that this night you'll be with me in my Father's house. So I want to speak to somebody out there that maybe you don't know Jesus, you've never met him, but he's real. This is why we gather here, not to have a jolly little meeting, but to know more of him. And he will soon return. So if that is you, it's so simple to give your life to Jesus. It's just basically saying, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Take me. And if that's spoken to you, I suggest that you just find yourself a little quiet place where you can just speak to God face to face. And I promise you, it won't be easy. Never is. But just like Heidi read out in the first, the guy who gave his life, just come and mess my life up now, Lord. Just come and mess my life up.
because it's the most exciting journey that you'll ever be on. And it's good to be reminded, you know, about the basics. And uh, so I'm going to hand over to Troy, um, who's going to bring our message all the way from America. Um, he recorded this earlier on the week. Um, so, Lord, I just pray for Troy and for Robin. Lord, just protect them right now as they have got out of the trench. And we just ask you now, Lord, to just saturate them in your presence, in your love as a family. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, good morning. Again, my name's Troy. Uh, to all the those of you in, at Bushfire Ministries and those that are paying, that are watching, um, just say hi. Good morning. Uh, this is, I believe, going to be April 9th. So uh, let's just open in prayer this morning and and uh, and then we'll we'll kind of get underway. What I what I want to say this morning. So. Father, once again, we just give you thanks. Lord, we praise you, Father, for your good God, and your, you deserve to be praised. You deserve all glory and all honor. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your intention for us and toward us. And we thank you, Father, Lord, that uh, we can share time together and just uh, talk about your word the things, Father, that you have on your heart, Lord, we we ask this morning that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see that. And uh, once again, Father, we just pray and we ask all things in Lord Jesus Christ's name, your holy son. Amen. So <clears throat> this morning, um, it was my intention initially to uh, talk about preparation, but um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to change up and uh, maybe talk, I think I'm going to title this the times we're living in and I'm going to change up about the preparation and maybe I, I think we're supposed to be there in a, a few weeks, uh, two or three weeks, something like that, four weeks, I don't remember exactly the date, but um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that and just have some conversation about that, you know, uh, different forms of preparation, but so this morning I want to talk about again the times we're living in and 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 really about the book of Revelation. Uh I'm sure uh, most of the people that have been listening to Andy um and and probably Alex as well and I don't know and whoever else maybe even Mark Johnson uh, um just uh, I'm sure there's been plenty plenty talked about um as far as the book of Revelation and you know, in the, some of the times we're living in, I just, I, I bring this up because one of the things that I've noticed is that recently, man, it seems like everybody that I'm talking to is studying or in some form or another in the book of Revelation. Um, and there are different places in it. They're either having Bible studies on it or they've, you know, they just felt like they're supposed to be reading it and um man i mean this is this is uh, not just people that i would consider believers that uh but i mean even some of the people that are are not christians not believers whatsoever are are having conversations with me about you know wow are you noticing things that are happening you know signs of the time so to speak they just don't know how necessarily to put it into um, uh, biblical terms. So um, anyway, because of that, I just thought, man, I really probably should spend a little time talking about this. And and um, again, just a, an inordinate amount of people that are, um, again, talking about the end of the age, talking about end times, you know, the from from a number of different aspects. I think uh, uh, just kind of go through a list of things, you know, that it, it kind of um, put together, you know, just like, first of all, we'll just talk about some of the reasons why people are are talking about the book of Revelation so much at this point. Uh, 
And that is that I think uh, the, one of the first things is that I, I, I hear from people, and this is more uh, non-Christians, but but Christians as well. I'm hearing some of this, you know, similar things, and that's a, a lot of people are saying, you know, that it's they're, they're looking out there in the world, and it's like, well, things are really getting scary out there, you know. Again, it's it's wars and rumors of wars and all those kinds of things, and and you know, for a lot of people, that that can be a scary thing, especially if you don't have the foundation of of Christ in your life, then we we tend to lean on our own understanding and 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 you when you're looking around in the natural things things look like they're um they're not going well and 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 i mean to to some degree that's absolutely true and in a lot of the cases you know the some of the conversations that i'm having with some of these people you know i'm i'm when they make those statements you know that things are are really looking bad out there you know, and they're like, well, sooner or later, they're bound to get better. And I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm just not of that belief. Um, you know, I tell them, I don't really, I don't really see things actually getting better. I think they're going to get significantly worse. And, and when I say significantly, I mean significantly worse at some point. So that's one of the things, um, again, uh, some people are, have, that I've talked to, they're, they're in, started in the book of revelation because they kind of feel like we're getting close to the end or they think we're getting close to the end and that maybe they should be in the book of revelation kind of studying um you know just really kind of looking to see what it has to say most most of the christians that i know throughout my life very few people ever spend any time in the book of revelation a lot of people um believe that it's just too hard to understand that it, it it's you know, it's mystical, it is, it's symbolic, it's, you know, there's a number of different things that people say throughout the years, you know, have said throughout the years of why they just don't, you know, they don't spend any time in it. And they, they, um, where they go to church, it, it's really never taught out of and, and those kinds of things. So there's, you know, that's, that's one of those things. Um, some of the people have said, well, we're, I mean, they don't know, this seems kind of crazy, but they're like, well, we're, we're noticing other people around us that are are spending time in the book of Revelation, you know, trying to study that book. So we're kind of thinking we should be doing that too. Um, I, I, that doesn't seem like a very uh, uh, rational necessarily thing to, to do as far as that goes. You know, you're doing it because somebody else is doing it. But, you know, you would hope that um, it would be kind of out of the unction of the Lord, right? The, the, the urging of the Lord that you might spend a little bit of time in his word. And, and uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of laughing a little bit just because it, it, it seems a little, um, I don't know what the word is, disingenuous maybe or something. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, um, when I had a number of conversations recently with people that, uh, that I know are, uh, they're believers, they're Christians, been Christians a long time. I've known some of these people for a very long time. And and in, you know, uh, in knowing them, I also understand that they're very much into uh, pre-tribulation doctrine, that they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And um, so, you know, for the most part, they don't even believe they're going to be here during the tribulation period. But they're feeling like they should be studying in the book of Revelation. And, you know, in those conversations that I'm having with those people, I'm like, well, I'm not really sure why you're bothering to do that, because for the most part, you don't believe that you're going to be here. And they they flat out, you know, categorically say, we're not. I mean, we are, we will not be here for that tribulation period. Like, okay, so then why, what is the point of you actually even spending time in that book? Or, or honestly, for uh, in reality, why do you spend much time in any of it? You know, I mean, if you really believe that you're not going to have to go through here, you, you really go through the tribulation period, you're going to have to literally throw away a, a large percentage of what's actually written in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. You know, it, it, you know, Jesus talking about the 
the end of the age and you know paul talking about the end of the age to different you know in different epistles different letters to you know that that he's written there and and also um even uh you know john in the book of revelation why he's he's speaking significantly about the end of the age and what's going to happen now with that being said and i'll address that in a minute that's not really what the book is about but you know we see a number of uh other things you know and and people are they're you know in the book of revelation they're in there and you're just starting to hear man just a number of uh, of people and and i know this is not new but just a number of crazy things that they they kind of pull out of there out of that book and again we're going to address in a, you know in a little bit few minutes here we'll address some of the things that the book is is really about as opposed to some of the things you know that um that we kind of make it make it about because we a, a lot of us in the christian world we tend to tend to believe that this book is really an eschatological writing and and that that's really what it's about it's just kind of describing to us um how the end of the age is going to be and that's more what it's about than anything else and 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 that, that's not really the case it, it 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 is in the sense that yes it does have um an overtone of eschatology in it meaning you know how things are going to play out and and uh, whatnot but but we we really should be paying attention to the fact that in there this is this is the it's the culmination of the intention of god it is and it's the end where he comes back for his wife for his bride and and if we miss that fact then we we tend to look at a lot of other things in that in that book in particular the book of revelation and we we miss the overall uh, context of it i mean there's a lot of things uh you know we see people talking about seven mountains theories and doctrines and you know we're going to fix all of this stuff we as as the church are going to fix all of this and make it all right and 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 that's what's going to bring the Lord back once we get this all this whole thing fixed on the earth. And I mean, you know, some of this stuff is just nonsensical. It doesn't say that. It doesn't even indicate that. So, you know, again, there's a lot of different different understandings and and uh, doctrinal beliefs that we get out of, um, we, you know, that even out of the Bible period, but but certainly out of the Book of Revelation, also a number of things that that are just they're not they're just not right. Um, it helps again I'm going to go back to this and not that we don't look at this from a an eschatological standpoint but but more from a marital perspective the Lord is looking to marry us and and that's always been his intention it was the intention that he had for us from the time that he created Adam and we can we can walk through this all the way through the Bible, and and we see uh, a a lot of this, right? It just over and over and over throughout the scriptures that that it it's very clear that that's been his intention. Um, I, I always I, I go back to a, a, a passage of scripture that I I make reference to a lot, and I'm sure you'll. As we kind of go through these things you'll hear me say this but um in hosea the book of hosea chapter 2 verse 16 and i'm going to paraphrase this a little bit again uh, we see that uh the lord is basically telling us at the end of the age at the at in you know at the last day in the last days and he said this is kind of the desire of my heart again i'm paraphrasing this but the desire of my heart has been that you would always be my wife right that you would that you would call me Ishi, which means husband. That means his intention is that we would be his wife, not to call him Bali or master or Lord, right? That we would call him husband. And, and we can see out of that a very in, intentional thing for us, right? Again, you go back to the garden, he makes the statements about Adam and that it's not good that men should be by himself should be alone and and he's really making the reference to to christ not i mean yes it applies to adam but again you can go through the the scriptures and you realize that that 
and even makes the the connection between Adam and and Christ. So anyway, I'm going to go back to some of the reasons here. I'm going to get off. I tend to do that. Get off under rabbit trails, and you know, as we 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 kind of start talking about these things and things that I I think are very important for us to understand. Uh, one of the other things that we've seen uh, recently is a, a number of people, people that I know and 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 people that I don't, um, talking about the seals being broken, right? And that, uh, I mean, even to some degree, I, some of the people out there are actually saying that we've entered into that tribulation period, into that seven years. Scripturally, I find that hard hard to even imagine or believe because of of the things that the scriptures say and and i just i, I we'll go through those in a second here um uh, but let's just address the seals being broken i don't necessarily know whether the seals are broken at this point or not i don't believe anybody necessarily does uh we i, I know there are people who say and they they do believe that um the seals, at least from the way I understand scripture and the timeline of things, I don't necessarily see that the seals, uh, the first and the second seal, at least anyway, I don't see that they have to be inside the seven year period to be broken and that the first of the, the couple of the riders on the horses would be released. I don't see it saying that, but that doesn't mean that it it, it is outside of that seven years either. So again I, I'm, I'm addressing the fact that people have have said that they're you know they believe that the first first and some of them have said even the second seal has been broken and and again those two okay and we're talking about out of revelation chapter six um the third seal kind of one of those things that you know Again, it's it's an economic thing, and we certainly see economic issues happening all over the world. You know, you start getting into that fourth fourth seal being broken, and now we've got significant problems when people start saying that. So, again, um, just a number of reasons why people are kind of looking into the book of Revelation. You know, there's a lot of chatter going on, a lot of talk. You know, and and it's lots of speculation, and and I I think that anytime that starts happening, it starts making people nervous and starts drawing them into um, speculation, can you know even to the point of making conclusions about some things, and you know I think we need to make sure we stick with what Scripture says and and stay away from beliefs you know well this is just what I believe whether the Scripture says it or not I think we need to stay away from you know, external doctrinal things that are not scriptural. And if we do, I think it it will, it will serve us um, wisely. Um, so let's 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 move on and, and and out of the reasons as to why people are in the book of Revelation, but and and uh, us moving down to the end of the age. And let's 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 ask ourselves. We should always ask ourselves questions. Right. Don't just assume anything that anybody is telling you that it's correct or it's it's even that it's scriptural. Um, I've I, I paid a little bit of a price for that, you know, throughout the years, again, making assumptions that the people that are talking to me, uh, whether they're from the pulpit or whatever, you know, the people who who have got theological degrees. Uh, I'm not even sure what that means, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, you know, they've gotten some, some form of education out of the Bible. Uh, the last time I checked that when Jesus was walking the earth, those who were biblically educated, and I'm going to, I want to be careful when I say this, but he doesn't pick anybody like that. None of the guys that he picks to walk with him had any, any necessarily biblical education whatsoever. As a matter of fact, most of those people, he has some significant, you know, chastising for it. You know, with that being said, I'm not saying that being, you know, educating yourself in the, in the word is a bad thing. I just, the problem is, is that we tend to pass on doctrinal beliefs through through that teaching. So with that being said, let's let's just ask ourselves a couple of questions here. And number one is, uh, 
why now? Why why is now the 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 point where people are starting to talk about the end of the age and why? Uh, I know Andy's talked about it. You know, a, a bunch. We've had conversations between Andy, myself, and and a, you know one of the other guys that does this, Alex uh, Adame. Um, again, and I'm sure Andy's and he's brought this up in the past. So maybe this is just a you know just review, and it more than likely it is. Uh, again, why now? Why why people have been talking about this and saying, well, we're at the end of the age you know, for at least probably close to 100 years, if not more than 100 years, you know, all along, it's like, this is it, you know, we've, we're, <clears throat> you know, the, the the end of the world is happening. So, I mean, let's, let's, let's just go back into the, the 20th century. So in the 1900s, right, we watched, we see two significant wars that happen, right? World War One, World War, World War Two. And in those war, wars, um, again, a lot of the people on the planet at that point were in the church. I'm talking about in the church. We're looking and saying, this is it. We're at the end of days. The end of the age is upon us. And, you know, because they ref, they go back and refer to, you know, they're talking about wars and rumors of wars. And this is the, you know, kind of the precursor to the things that, that, um, come about at, at the end of the age again if if, if we would have just stopped just for a second again and, and really bothered to read the scriptures we would know that that that's not even possible so we see world war one happens and a lot of people were pointing to stalin as as uh you know as the uh, uh antichrist world war ii rolls around and and again you know we have we have massive war, it, it, but only in a specific part of the world, right? Each of these, even though they're world wars, they're pretty, pretty still pretty localized. It's not global. World War II, Hitler, people starting pointing the finger, you know, Hitler's the Antichrist, Mussolini's the Antichrist. I mean, you, you, people start pointing the fingers at people because they're doing things and, and literally becoming warmongers and, and people look at that and think well that's the antichrist he's a warmonger it may be but we're but we've we as as christians as believers by doing that we've negated things that need to happen scripturally in order for for us to actually be at the end of the age and 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 let's we probably need to define that a little bit what is what is the last days? How, the end of the age? How how far is that? How long is that? Well, I'm going to say it's probably seventy to eighty years. That that's again that's that's just me. I'm 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 throwing that out there, and you know, could it be a hundred years? Could be. I mean, that that's very possible. So we're going to look at some of the reasons why that the end of the age, and and that tribulation period because that's what that's what we're kind of talking about here people looking and saying oh well when the wars broke out we're literally that's we've entered into that tribulation period because there's war all over the world and and i'm sure if you were <laughs> as as you guys there living in england i'm sure as you guys were were looking at it man this is this is it these are wars to end all wars um you know it's it devastates your country and and um uh, and much of Europe, certainly. But again, it's not global. Um, so reasons why it couldn't have happened before now, if we just we just start looking at some of the scriptures, let's, let's, let's take a look in the book of Revelation again first, because that's what we're kind of talking about here, being in that book. And one of the things we see is that much of what's happening in there that John is seeing and writing about takes place or centers in and around Jerusalem. Okay. In order for that to have happened, Israel would have had to have to have already been reestablished as a nation, and it didn't. It 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 wasn't reestablished as a nation until nineteen well forty eight recognized 1947 is really when the, it, the the initial part of it happens but 
1947 or 48, it was impossible for things to have been happening in Jerusalem as far as the Jews are concerned or Israelis and in conjunction with World War I or World War II. It's there, there before Israel even be, it is reestablished. So that's the first part. Israel, right, has to be reestablished. We know that happens in 19, let's just call it 1948. The next thing is Jerusalem, right? Again, because it, it centers all around this tiny, all of this centers around a tiny little, you know, plot of ground on the planet in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem doesn't come back into the hands, even though Israel is reestablished as a nation in 1948, the Jews don't have control of Jerusalem at all, any control whatsoever until 1967. So in 1967, they get, I'm going to use the word partial control because they don't, they still don't have total control. Even at this point, they do not have total control of Jerusalem. And part of that is because they don't have control of the Temple Mount. Okay, so whether anybody thinks they do or not, they're, they do not have control of the Temple Mount, which is in right in Jerusalem, which makes it virtually impossible to say that they have full control of Jerusalem. Why is that important? First of all, as we see in, in Revelation, we see in um, a couple of other, other books, and we'll, we'll address some scripture out of some other places here, but we see that the temple becomes important, and it must be built in order to fulfill the prophecy that is spoken of in the, in the scriptures. Um, we see that that a prophecy that's spoken of not only in Daniel and in Ezekiel, but in, in uh, Thessalonians, and we'll address a couple of these things in a second here. But without the temple being built, some of those things are there it's an impossibility for them to happen so the temple has to be built in order for us to to not to come into that seven year period but for us to progress through the seven year period now with that being said if you've been to jerusalem or have bothered to do some research on this one of the things that you go to uh the temple institute there and we were fortunate enough the years to go to uh, the first time that Sadhu ever uh, had a conference there in Jerusalem, we we were fortunate to get to go there with them. And part of the tour we, that, that Sadhu had set up for us, um, I'm sorry, Sadhu Sundar Salvaraj, I, I assume that most everybody there knows who that is. Uh, Sadhu set up part of the tour was that we were to go to the Temple Institute, and in, which was highly informative. And by going there, one of the things that that come to realize is that they and they tell you this, they've got all the implements in the tem temple ready to go. They've got all of the the uh, the things that that to implement the daily sacrifices. Those they've already got that they've been raising the red heifers and they've they found all the stuff for the incense and um, and one of the other things is that they will tell you is that they that they have literally prefabricated. The temple and um and that it is sitting in a warehouse and that one of the things that they've they it's it's clearly it's off site because they 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 can't go up onto the temple mount or, or have not been able to go up on the temple mount and to do really anything and no construction but uh they've told us that it was the temple is literally sitting in a warehouse there somewhere i think in somewhere in jerusalem but um and that once they're given the green light, the go ahead to start construction there, that the temple, they will have the attempt, the temple uh, erected within 90 days from the time that they actually get the okay to go up and start construction there. That's fast. I mean, that is, um, I, I, I think all of this, hopefully we should be paying attention to some of these things and realize, you know, that all, again, all of these things, our fulfillments, right? Of if we can under, look at it from this particular understanding that they're, it's literally prophetic um, uh, words in scripture telling us that these things are going to happen. 
So let's let's move on and kind of look at a couple of other things. Number one, um, again, why is it that important? Why is it that important when we uh, that the temple needs to be rebuilt? So if we we can go to Second Thessalonians in chapter two. Um, verses one through five, one of the things that we see Paul tells us in there in, the, in his writings to the Thessalonians is that the, the Antichrist takes his seat in the temple, literally sets himself up in the temple, declaring himself to be God. Right there, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the temple has to be rebuilt, right, in order for that to happen. A couple other things that we see in those in that passage right there at Second Thessalonians chapter two and verses one through five, and I, I, you know, as always, I recommend you know that you read this stuff for yourself and 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 look it away. But one of the things is that is it's literally there's a timing aspect in there. He's talking about the coming of the Lord, right? So he's 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 talking about a specific time frame. First of all, and second of all, one of the things he's telling them is that look, don't get, don't don't be uh, bamboozled. I'll use that word. Don't be bamboozled, right? And and think that well, this has already happened. Again, you know, I know that there's a, a giant faction out there that says that all this stuff took place in 70 A.D. In my opinion, that's nonsense. N nonsense. I mean, John doesn't even start writing. He's not writing the book of Revelation until 95 AD. So we have some, some time frame issues there. But one of the things that, that Paul is telling the Thessalonians there in 2 Thessalonians is that also he said, look, don't, 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 don't uh, get yourself, you know, worried and things. He said, because you're going to see something, that, things that are going to happen before any of this happens, right? One of the things he says is it's the apostasy in the church, the falling away. These are Christians, right? You can't fall away from something that you're not a part of. So again, which kind of shoots at one of the those doctrinal beliefs out there, you know, in the foot. But um, again, the important part of the temple name needing to be built is because it, the Bible tells us that there are certain things that are going to happen in the temple, right? So they, it must be built. One of the other aspects, again, and I, I know that you guys have looked at this, but is out of the book of Daniel, chapter 9. Again, we're talking about things and uh, where we're at, the again, I, I said earlier that I know people that, and and now it sounds like there's more than more than a couple that have been making declarations that we've entered into the tribulation. Actually, given us dates that we've entered into the tribulation period. Um, I, I, I again scripturally, I just I I struggle with with anybody doing that at this point because in the book of daniel chapter 9 let's, let's say verses 24 through 27 and and more specifically we're, we're looking you know and focusing on chapter uh on verse 27 and that is talking about it, it in that that 70th week right in that week or the seven years that we're talking about and in verse 27 it says, and he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offerings. And on the wing of the abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until complete destruction. And one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So in that, he's talking about a covenant being confirmed, right? Which is if we can put it in this context it's kind of a peace treaty uh, that's that it doesn't use the word peace treaty but it's it's in essence it's a covenant of peace between the the Jewish people between Israel and other nations and it and I want to make sure that we're 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 clear about this because the scripture says with many this isn't with one it's with it says with many so what does many mean uh, you know, I mean that that's a that's a little bit up for discussion. But as we speak, even before actually, let's just go back uh, a couple three years ago. Just and maybe everybody kind of knows this, and if you do, that's great. And you know, just kind of a refresher. But uh, when 
our president, President Trump, was in office. His son-in-law, Jared Kushner, along with himself, and another guy named Mohammed bin Salman, who was uh, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, put started putting together what they call the Abrahamic Accord, or the Abraham Accords. And and in that, that's what it really is. Is it is a a treaty. It's a covenant, if we, if we can use that word, a peace treaty between Israel and other Arab or uh, Muslim countries. And at one point, my understanding was there were 14 countries had in theory kind of signed on to this, but um, because of the way things kind of went with uh, with the elections here and whatnot, Trump being, you know, uh, taken out of office and and um, and our, the guy in office now is not you're not really into this so we see that 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 whole thing that was kind of being put together kind of fell apart or at least got put on hold now as my understanding is in the last couple of months um january the end of january february uh, there's been uh, kind of a push to get this abraham accords back into play here again the covenant the peace treaty uh we see that it it talks about the peace in a couple of different you know different places if you go into the book of ezekiel um ezekiel 13 again this is talking about and i just i, I want us to, to to pay some attention to this and that in, in ezekiel 13 verses 1 through 16 again i would highly recommend that you read read them i'm not going to read it so it's it really is talking about prophets prophesying things there and 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 literally i mean it, it really is addressing the false prophets because these prophets are saying things that uh that aren't really happening um the Lord's addressing them. I, you, you can go back into the, the book of Jeremiah and also, and you'll see some of the similar things. And, and you know, the Lord is going to deal with these guys who call themselves prophets and 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 start prophesying things that are not true, that, that aren't things that he's giving them to prophesy. And one of the things that we see in here, uh, in, in Ezekiel especially, right, is we see that this is, he's talking about, um, Again, peace. Prophets uh, uh, declaring peace when when there really isn't any peace, right? And so, uh, you know, let's just think about the overall group of people that we have out here in the on the planet at this point who call themselves prophets. And I, I'm gonna just say this, make them make this statement, and you know, if if we listen to all of these people. Who call themselves prophets who are constantly prophesying you know this or that or whatever you want to call it you know what however it is it, it sounds like god's schizophrenic because some of them are you know i mean they literally call themselves a prophet of god and they'll you know one of them is says you know well god thus saith the lord here and the other one says thus saith the lord there now with all that being said i want to make sure that i, I i'm not throwing off on prophets on a true prophet okay I think we just need to be wise. We need to pay attention and listen. Listen, right? Even in Revelation, you know, John is talking about, you know, the, those who who were wise and actually realized they 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 recognized that those who said they were apostles or, you know, it's the prophets were not, right? I mean, that's a uh, in Revelation chapter 3, I believe. So, again, saying there's peace, but there's not peace, and there's there are <laughs> there are those who are out there who are saying, listen, we're we're entering into peace with all of the, you know, with 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 the Muslims, with the Arabs, right? I mean, talking about Christians doing this in in Daniel, this is not talking about that. This is talking about is Israel. So. Again, why does that become important? Because if we, we go back, back to, let's go back to the Thessalonians, and we can see now in, 
in in uh, first Thessalonians, right? Again, Paul's writing to the Thessalonians, and and in first Thessalonians, we see that similar thing, right? Peace and safety. In Thessalonians chapter five, verses one through six, you know, uh, we're 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 looking at this, and we see in in in, in verse three again. He's telling us, right, we should, we, we as believers, we should know the times and the seasons of things. And that's true. We should know that. We should be like the sons of Issachar, right? Not only who know the times and seasons of things, but but that we, we, like them, they knew what Israel was to do. Daniel talks about those at the end of the age who have understanding, who have insight, mentions it several times. We should be like that. Again, in chapter five of First Thessalonians, he's he's talking about again at the end of the age and and that we should not be caught unaware, right? We should again know the times and the seasons. And then it says, you know, while they're saying peace and safety, destruction comes. Well, who's who's the one saying peace and safety? You go back to Ezekiel. I think we find that it's the prophets. We need to pay attention to what we're listening to and who we're listening to. And if what they're saying does not line itself up with Scripture, we need to be very, very, very careful. And we probably need to not pay attention to that. Again, that's First Thessalonians chapter 5. It tells us to be alert. Be paying attention. Because it tells us at that point again that Jesus had come like a thief in the night, right? I'm going to kind of end with a couple of things here. Number one, I'm going to go back to the back to the book of Revelation. I started off you know, in the beginning and saying it, it isn't, it's 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 not an eschatological book, a eschatological book, except the fact that it does it does have events and times and those kinds of things in it. It but it is really about the bride and the and the the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the that's the whole thing. It's it 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 it's the culmination of that, right? We go, we can see in Revelation uh, chapter nineteen, verse seven. This is after after the woman that's taken out of the wilderness after she's she's been out there for three and a half years being made ready. And if you want to see this in in uh, in a natural light, go back and read the book of Esther. You'll see the preparation that goes on there, getting herself ready to 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 come and meet the king and become the king's wife. But in 19.7, Revelation 19.7, it says the bride's made herself ready. She has made herself ready. And immediately we see now the Lord returns, right? Um, I make a joke about this, but, you know, it's like he's, he whistles and says, hey, get my horse. You know, I'm, I got to go get my wife. Revelation 22, chapter 22, verse 7 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. It's always been about the bride. You want to know what the book's about? Go to the end. Read the end of it. I don't care what book it is. You know, it will it will kind of tell you what the what the, the book's about. And this is in the Bible's no different. The spirit and the bride say come. It's not the spirit in anything else. Not spirit in believers, not spirit in friends, it's not spirit in anything else. It's the spirit and the bride say come. And he comes. That's that's his intention. His intention is literally to come and get his wife, not come in for any other reason. Well, that's it. I'm going to end. Uh, try to make sure that I'm not over my time. I I tend to have a t I tend to do that. So anyway, uh, thanks. I, I appreciate the time, and um, we'll see you in. Uh, We'll see you in, in, in a few weeks. That's it. God bless. Everybody be be safe. And may the Lord bless you. Bye. Amen. It was good, wasn't it? Really, really good. Um, it's so refreshing to hear it from somebody else. I bet instead of hearing it 
from me all the time. But it's just so, I mean, for me, that was so refreshing. Because this is how, when we get together, this is how we are. We just get out the Bible and we say, what's the word saying? You know, let's cut out the noise. Let's shut the door, cut out the noise, get the book open and say, well, this is what the Bible says. This is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And putting the word to match the word. Like, I'll throw something out to you. In Daniel, the book of Daniel, this is just when I was doing the recording for the revelation that's going up into company 42, and I think I'm doing session 13. I th- you know, and yet, thank, thank you all those that are joining us for the Bible study on a Tuesday night, because I'm only on chapter 6, the first three verses, and I'm on seri- uh, talk 13. We're at chapter 21. So, uh, but I'm getting, as I've gone through it again, and making another recording for Company 42, I'm getting a little bit more understanding, a little bit more revelation. So here's the thing. He talked about the Abrahamic Covenant Accord that's been drawn up. Daniel tells us, what is that covenant? He says, you look, you look at it, Daniel 11. He says, and Daniel 9, in the middle of the week, you know, uh, he's going to break that covenant. But Daniel mentions a covenant, and it's this, folks. This is what we've got to look for. Is a covenant that Daniel's talking about. It's where people recognize the covenant that the Israelis, that Israel is their land, and that they can live there in, in Israel. That's the covenant. It's not something that's going to be drawn up It's going to be giving the right for every Jewish person to be living in Israel as its Israeli land. That's the holy covenant that Daniel talks about. Because the Antichrist will come in and go against the the people of the holy covenant. That's how it's described in Daniel 11. But what produces that? Again, Troy very, very well presented the thing in Thessalonians. In, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he, and he said the first six verses, which we all know is when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come. It echoes the very words that Jesus said. Very words that Jesus said in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. So what is going to bring peace to, into Israel? We spoke about it a little bit on our last Bible study. Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 12. Are they three different wars? Are they the same war? Or are they two the same and one different? But here's my thought on it. From what my going deeper into the word is what produces peace in Israel? where they have no walls, and it says no gates. No fences, no walls, no gates. What is going to produce that peace? War. War, where they win the war. Where they win the battle. They win against the ones around their country. Remember what Troy said, Israel, Jerusalem. So what's the second horse rider? The black horse, which is world war. It's going to affect every person around the world, these next wars. Sorry, the, the red one, that's war. Sorry, did I say black? No, that's, sorry, I meant the red one. <clears throat> yep, the red horse rider is war. It's going to affect everyone, but it's also going to affect the Middle East. Because the last seven years goes from World War to Middle Eastern centric. But yet what will happen in the first four horses going forth is going to affect the world. But it is going to bring a sense of peace and safety. So you've got to try and just get your heads around it a little bit. Do your own study on it. So please, if you're sat at home, don't take my word for it. 
Get a whole bunch of people around, get the word open, and just start talking about it. Just start examining the book of Revelation. It is fun. It's exciting. It's the blueprint that God has given to us as it's written in Daniel. Daniel, close up this book because it's not for you. It's for the end time generation. That is yet to come. But in Daniel 12, verses 1 to 3, it talks about a body of people that are going to have wisdom and knowledge and understanding. It echoes Isaiah 60. Yes, it's both and, the Jewish nation, and a body of people that are going to shine, because in Isaiah 60, it's predominantly talking about Israel. It's talking about the people of Israel. But it's both and. It's both Israel-centric. Yes, there is going to be a time when Israel is going to shine for the world to see. And many Gentiles will come to that light. But it's both and. If you look, if you examine that with Daniel 12 and put those three verses together of Daniel 12, 1 to 3, and you put the things together with Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah 60. So let's not get out of our head that Isaiah 60 is speaking to us. It's both and. Because it talks about the, is the Jewish nation shining where they, the, the Gentiles come to their light. So we've got to understand scripture. Yet there will be a body of people who know their God that will be strong and courageous. Daniel 11.32 tells us that. Daniel 12 tells us that they will shine with the brilliance of him. So let's make it fun. Let's start, you know, instead of getting, oh, it's all about doom and gloom. No, it's the return of the Lord where the bride has made herself ready. And when does the bridegroom come for the bride? When it says that do not be, Paul says this in Thessalonians, don't, don't get unaware when the thief comes in the middle of the night. When is the wedding? When does the bridegroom come for his bride? At the midnight hour. Because that's what it's about. But you are in light. You know that the hour you won't get caught short because you know the Lord is coming back for his bride and coming back for the kingdoms of this world where they will become his kingdom. Not kingdoms, his kingdom. And then we will see, as in, as in heaven, the reality of what we're meant to be as in heaven, from a heavenly perspective, onto an earthly. This is not reality. That is reality. Heaven is reality. This earth is not, it's temporary. And it will only be in its fullness when we see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So this is why we are studying the book of Revelation, so that we are not in darkness but in light. And we, and what Troy said is absolutely right, 100% right, is that we are called to know the time and season. Just this week, in not a, in not a horrible way, but it was somebody, you know, just some people who Heidi and I know um, were saying, you know, almost the words of, Andy, you're all about one message. The end times. <laughs> and I'm saying, yep, absolutely, it's about the end times. Why? Because we're in them. We're in them. It's exactly what Troy said. So thank you, Troy. I know you'll listen to this and our love to you and uh, Robin and obviously Alex and Tyler as well. We're going to be seeing them in May. Um, but we've got a lot of work here to do. But I want, first want to say, God bless you all, those who are streaming. We love you lots. And that person who has given, not given their life to the Lord, please give your life to the Lord. It's going to be the fun time that you've ever, it's been for such a time as this, that you are going to be saved. So please, and then you know, write, write us an email if this is you and, and just let us know because we want to hear testimonies that are, you know, yes, to excite us um, and to grab us, don't we? I love seeing people come to the Lord. I just love it. <clears throat> so thank you to all those streamers. Um, thank you. Yes, of course, yeah. Yes. Oh, if you want to um, be part of the conference, um, Heidi, do you, do you want to come and do it? You know. Yeah. And then you can.
Everybody here in the room knows about it, so I'm going to look at the camera. There is the camera. Um, so, yes, we're going to have a conference here on the 14th and the 15th of May, which is a Saturday and a Sunday. And um, it's going to be quite intimate. We really look forward to it. We're going to have our American friends come over, uh, Troy, Robin, and Alex and Tyler, and our good selves. And we're going to have time for worship together. We're going to hear the word. Um, it's, we're going to have food together and fellowship. So it's a really good time to join us. So if you'd like to join us, um, did I give the right dates? You look at me. No, 13th and 14th. Oh, 13th and 14th, you see. Everybody needs a Denise in their life. <laughs> Sorry, Saturday 13th and uh, Sunday the 14th of May. Uh, come and join us here in Sheffield. There are places to stay. Um, I can help you, point you in the right direction. If you'd like to come, it is free, but email me. Email You can email Heidi, H-E-I-D-I, -I, at so bushfireministries.co.uk so we can make sure we've got enough food. And um, that would be absolutely fantastic. But yes, it's one not to miss. So God bless you streamers. We love you. you know, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your encouragement that I get with emails, me encouraging me and Heidi. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, you know, and, and it's great. 